a great pleasure to welcome you to the Crossbow event series here at UNC Chapel Hill. And as you know, unfortunately, already, this is the final Crossbow event series for this uh, semester. Time flies like crazy, and uh, who would have thought that we already had our final event? We had five, six events this semester, so it was a pretty packed uh, semester. And we will start off again in September. Until then, until September, I know you will be missing us, clearly. Uh, what you can do to bridge the gap is really to look at our YouTube channel. That is very good watching and viewing. And as you know, we uh, show and uh, display, put uh, all our events on our YouTube channel. And uh, I can tell you that uh, all events uh, this semester are already have already been uploaded. The address would be youtube.com slash Cresno UNC. I'm Klaus Lars and I'm the Richard M. Cresno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at UNC <coughs> Chapel Hill. And again, I can confirm it's really sunny in Chapel Hill. Um, today, I, have, uh, I should say, I'm really very pleased to once again have a very full house today. Throughout the semester, we had between 150 and 180 people in this room, with some people having to sit on the floor. And I have to thank my students for occupying the, uh, the floor rather than the chairs. And it's great that today we have reached the same number of people. Please, in September, when we come back, please come also back and uh, be a great audience. Today is your final chance to get your name on our mailing list. The mailing list has been distributed, so if you put your name and email address on the mailing list, then uh, I will put you and transfer your name into our electronic mailing list and you will get information about what is coming up next <laughs> semester. Um, also, we, as you know, we have a, a, a website, it is crasnoevents.com. Please do not forget to check it occasionally to see if anything has happened and when the next events are coming up. I would like to uh, greet a few people who have come here today and have made a special effort to come here uh, today. That is, for example, John Wei. He is the chairman of the China American Economic and Cultural Association. Then we have Joyce Wong, who is a, a, one, who is a journalist on the World uh, Journal. We have uh, Mr. Mao, who is editor of the China Press for North Carolina and South Carolina. And we have Dr. Lian, who is a professor of marine science at North Carolina State University, and is also chairman of the Carolina China Council. And I'm also very pleased to welcome <coughs> Ambassador Jim Slasser, who is a former US ambassador to China. So, and there are, of course, many other people, I can't uh, mention all by name, but many other distinguished <coughs> people. And thank you very much for coming again today. Our special guest today, as you know, is Susan Thornton. Susan is, uh, was a former acting assistant secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs and she um, has worked extensively on China and Susan and I met at Princeton some time ago and then again in the State Department so we go back a little while but not, not decades but a few years and that of course was all the good old days before Trump. <laughs> as, a, as an acting assistant secretary, she dealt with China, as I said. She dealt with North Korea extensively, and of course with other geopolitical developments in Asia. In her previous jobs in the State Department over the last two decades, she also dealt with Taiwan. She dealt with U.S.-China's uh, cyber security and cyber agreement. She uh, looked at uh, the Paris Climate Accord and was involved in working on that. And she also was involved on the agreed framework on North Korean denuclearization. So she has plenty of experience, and of course we will all benefit from that experience today. And she also was posted outside the United States, overseas, for example in Russia, in China, in Central Asia, and in the Caucasus. So these were all difficult assignments, and uh, she will tell us more about it, I hope, uh, when she will talk to us in a few minutes. Uh, Susan Thornton now is a research scholar at the Yale China Center and she also is a um, scholar at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. It's a great uh, pleasure to welcome Susan today and she will talk about can we live with China, U.S. China, Chinese relations in tumultuous times. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Susan.
Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for such a resounding North Carolina welcome. And welcome to all of our distinguished guests and Ambassador Sasser. I didn't know you were going to be here, so now I'm nervous. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much for coming today. I'm trying to get my technology to cooperate here. Let's see if it will. Um, uh, I'm very happy that Klaus asked me to come to North Carolina because I got to come here. Can everyone hear me? Uh, I got to come here on this incredibly beautiful day, and we got here a little bit early because I came with my mom, who lives in Southern Pines, North Carolina, and we got to walk around this gorgeous campus and. On a day like today, walking around in a place like Chapel Hill, it just makes you want to go back to school, right, everybody? Yeah. <laughs> it's just amazing. So beautiful. So, so congratulations to all of you who get to spend a lot of time, a lot more time than me. It's my first time here on this campus. It's incredible, and in, and in this beautiful state of North Carolina. Uh, I currently live in Maine. We're having different weather up there right now, so I'm really appreciating this. Um, and as Klaus mentioned, I'm, I'm currently um, in residence at Yale, so I travel back and forth between Maine and, and Connecticut. Um, but I have been traveling around uh, outside of Washington quite a bit in the U.S. Um, recently, since I left the State Department in August of last year. And uh, I also travel some uh, overseas and going to China next week. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the title of my talk first. Klaus did ask me to give him a provocative title um, so that we would draw in a good crowd like the one we've got here today. Um, and I think, uh, can we live with China is a question that, it's funny that we have to even ask that now. Um, but as one of the students I was talking to earlier today said, that you know that's a really hard question now for us to answer. And uh, we have to think about it more than we've ever had to think about these kinds of questions before, I think. And so it's a good uh, place for us to start today. And I know Klaus is planning uh, for me to talk for about a half an hour or so. And then I hope really to engage in a dialogue with you. Because since leaving the State Department, one of the things that uh, I am really trying to dedicate my time and myself to is uh, talking more outside of the so-called Washington Beltway, the National Security Industrial Complex, as I call it, with, with you know Americans outside of, of, the, of the circle um, that we typically worked in when I was in the State Department about foreign policy, about relations with countries, um, you know, foreign countries, and um, also in particular China, and, and why it matters to all of us, and what we should be thinking about these issues because. I mean, I'm now in Maine. I live on a 480-acre farm. I talk to a lot of people that focus on different things than people that, you know, I worked with in the State Department all those years. And, and it's very illuminating to get their perspective on things and, and see how they look at the world. And so I hope that you can share some of your perspectives with me today. Um, I think it's sort of a mark of our of where we've come in our appreciation of foreign policy and diplomacy that we have to start out at the top with a discussion of can we live with China, U.S.-China relations in tumultuous times. Uh, you know, it's only become more reality-based um, discussion since we came up with the topic actually maybe six months ago was that we started talking about this. And so I, I was thinking at the time, well, maybe we'll be getting in a a more positive trajectory by then, and it won't fit, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it fits like a glove. Um, tumultuous times is what we have. We have daily stories about the trade war with China, uh, China's, quote, predatory economic practices, theft of intellectual property, uh, China cheating on the economy. We have daily front page stories almost about these topics. The acting uh, Defense Secretary, Defense Secretary Shanahan, and others have said that China is the greatest threat to the United States. Um, the FBI director has called China a whole of society threat. Quote. And um, letters are being circulated to universities warning them about potential threats from Chinese students and scholars. 
Um, the Justice Department has launched a campaign to warn companies and organizations about Chinese infiltration. And uh, some in the, in the sort of Washington Beltway area and the national security field um, are, are calling for decoupling or separation of the US and Chinese economies, uh, in part or in whole. Others assert that China is an existential threat to the American way of life and are calling for a new Cold War. So these are things that may not be penetrating as much outside the Washington Beltway bubble um, as they are inside, but this is the uh, discourse and the rhetoric on U.S.-China relations that, believe me, people in Beijing and across greater China are hearing from the United States. So even if we're not that aware of it, people on the other side of the Pacific are very aware of it. Um, this is obviously a huge change. Maybe Ambassador Sasser can speak to how big a change it is from when he was in China um, in the, I think it was the 90s. Yes, at the end of the 90s, yes. Um, although he lived through some tumultuous times too, I think, right? Um, so, but aside from that, the U.S. has, I think, traditionally seen China as an opportunity. If we step way back and look at the U.S.-China relationship from from a, a high level. Um, you know, in the early days of U.S.-China interaction, U.S. actors focused on opening China up to the outside world. And uh, in those days, this was done by merchants, by traders, um, by missionaries who went to China. Uh, in World War II, of course, China and the U.S. were allies. Um, and the U.S. saw China as crucial to its plans for the Pacific theater. The U.S. tried to bring about a compromise and an end to China's civil war. In 1949, George Marshall was dispatched um, to try to broker a compromise between Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek. Of course, his mission <coughs> failed and, and touched off a McCarthyist impulse in the United States as we launched this search for the communist um, sympathizers who lost China. Um, and, and at that point, we entered this period of estrangement with China that lasted from 1949 until the diplomatic uh, opening that Nixon embarked on. Um, when the compromise with uh, Mao Zedong didn't work out, um, he turned to the Soviet Union to help him modernize China. And um, of course, that proceeded apace for a decade or so, but then uh, Mao became disillusioned with the Soviet Union, and he um, actually, China fought a couple of fierce battles with its near uh, communist, <laughs> ostensibly communist neighbors, Vietnam and Russia and, and the Soviet Union at that time. But when, when Mao turned away from the Soviet Union and became disillusioned, that's when Nixon and Henry Kissinger saw the opportunity to, you know, have a chance to engage China for, on a couple of different levels. First, they saw the chance that China would provide a counterweight or, or a balance to uh, Soviet aggression and that China <coughs> might become um, a partner in our efforts in the Cold War, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. Um, but of course, Nixon at that time also spurred American popular imagination with his notion that we needed to open up to China we couldn't keep her outside, forever outside the community of nations there to nurse her paranoid fantasies um, and nurse her grievances. So I think that was also a part of the Nixon opening that really kind of set the tone in America for the post-79 kind of engagement with China. It was, it was different than the Soviet Union. We were embroiled in the Cold War and China was helping us. Um, and that continued uh, with various ups and downs and vagaries through the Reagan administration um, and then you know carried on until basically uh, 1989 or 1991 depending on how you want to characterize the, the changes in the world but I think 1991 the collapse of the Soviet Union was a very important break point um, for US China relations uh, certainly 1989 the Tiananmen massacre was another very important uh, moment in U.S.-China relations. But I do think that the uh, visionary diplomatic opening that took place 40 years ago 
needs to be appreciated for what it, um, the possibilities that it opened up. We saw 40 years of peace in the Asia Pacific following the 1979 diplomatic normalization with China. We saw the Asian economic miracle that that peace engendered and made possible. And I think, um, you know, that brought about the greatest reduction in poverty and increase in human well-being in, in, in recent history. And so uh, all of that can be laid, I think, at the feet, at least partially, of this, of this opening and this kind of vision that Nixon and Kissinger had uh, four decades ago, actually this year. This is the 40th anniversary of the opening to China. Now China, of course, is the second largest economy in the world, and by some measures, it's the first largest. Um, it's the number one trading partner of many countries in the world, especially in the Asia-Pacific region. China's current population is 1.4 billion, which is one-fifth of global humanity. Uh, it has almost 1 billion internet users and 1.6 billion cell phone subscribers. Um, the population density of China's eastern half of the country, where most people live, is nine times that of the United States. So this is a very compact population dense part of the world. China now has over 160 cities with more than a million people. Does anyone know how many the U.S. has? Nine. Ten. Who said nine? Very close. And maybe that was right last year. Ten. <laughs> Most of them are in California and Texas, um, except New York and Philadelphia. Um, so, you know, I think that's just an astonishing set of statistics. And um, I had a conversation earlier today with a China watcher where we were talking about impressions of China and the United States and the psychology surrounding the U.S.-China relationship. And you cannot think about it without thinking about China's size, because it's, it's just so uh, uh, kind of weighs in on every single kind of aspect of issue in U.S.-China relations. Um, of course, Napoleon said famously, you know, let China sleep, because when she wakes, she will shake the earth. And I think the earth is shaking now. Um, and we may be regretting a little bit having having woken up the, uh, the sleeping giant. Um, so I think it's important um, for us to, to look, since we have this new dynamic in U.S.-China relations, at what has changed. And I think uh, this is a very important question that many people have tried to answer. What has changed? <coughs> Clearly, things have changed in both China and the United States, and those ch changes have brought us to what many people believe is a fundamental breakpoint in U.S.-China relations. Graham Allison at Harvard has posited that what is new is that the U.S. and China are entering into the Thucydides trap. How many people in the room have heard about this uh, Thucydides trap in Graham Allison's book? I heard the students in Klaus's class had to read this book, so there should be more hands. <laughs> um, he wrote a book about U.S.-China relations called Destined for War, recently. And that book is a bestseller where? China. Beijing, yeah, China, exactly. It just got translated into Chinese recently, and it's going like hotcakes. Um, so think about that. <laughs> uh, some say, of course, that the changes in China are what has led us to this this break point that we're that we're facing right now. And and it's certainly clear that China has embarked on a more aggressive foreign policy um, and has turned away from reform and opening since about I think the year 2008 is when we saw something like that start. Um, just after the great financial crisis, which someone said to me, we cleverly renamed the great financial crisis so no one would identify that it started in the U.S., but that's an aside. Um, I think, um, you know, China abandoned the economic reform program that was put forward in 2013, which a lot of American companies and global companies, a lot of foreign governments had pinned a lot of hopes on. We had been waiting to see China's 
reform pace pickup kind of all through the 2000s after its um, accession to the WTO in 2001 hadn't happened, but here all of a sudden was a blueprint for things they were going to do in 2013. None of it happened. Um, you know, along with this, of course, we saw an increase in the Chinese state's efforts to appropriate technology by whatever means. Uh, this was uh, in the service of you know, moving China's manufacturing and production levels up the value chain. And the Chinese government, we've all um, heard in discussions with them that they're worried about China's economy being stuck in the so-called middle income trap. That they'll be stuck in this place where they are now at about $8,000 uh, per capita GDP and they won't be able to, to graduate out of that and continue their sort of economic growth pattern. Um, and so they want to move up the value chain. What do you need to do that? You need technology. Who has technology? U.S. does, and other Western countries, and other countries, and so there was a sort of this implicit rush to try to appropriate technology by licit and illicit means, and we've heard a lot about this in the U.S. press. Um, I think, uh, you know, coincident with this, of course, was the renewed campaign of internal repression in China, a crackdown on activists, on lawyers, you know, a crackdown on Western and, and domestic uh, NGOs and civil society, religious groups, minorities, um, basically anyone that might organize to threaten party control in China. Um, and uh, I think this also actually incidentally goes some way towards showing how insecure Beijing's leaders are, that they, that they focus so much on this kind of in, in perceived internal threat. Um, and then, of course, we also saw the uh, building up of the islands in the South China Sea, which uh, you know was an, sort of an anomaly. In you know, China had prior to that time really, in its foreign policy approach, at least, pursued this kind of keeping a low profile policy that that uh, Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping had initiated, and you know the the sort of in-your-face kind of military buildup that we saw in the South China Sea really shook China's neighbors, really kind of um, revealed clearly in the day, light of day for the first time, you know, China's really aggressive and ambitious regional uh, sort of plans. And I think um, that, you know, in, in concert with all the rest of these sort of negative developments in the recent you know, decade at least, um, have really sort of <coughs> crystallized in the minds of people. And then, of course, two years ago when President Trump was elected, you know, he ran on um, sort of the, a lot of the China economic and, and sort of so-called predatory economic practices, which, which sort of dovetailed with the height of this sort of frustration on the part of a lot of countries over China's recent bad behavior. Um, but, but I would say things in the U.S. Have, have also changed. So when I give this talk and I talk to Chinese audiences, I, I normally focus on, of course, um, things that you know I see that the Chinese have done that have led us to this point and try to uh, prescribe some corrective <coughs> measures and ways that they could make some uh, changes that would lead to some improvement in the relationship. But... Um, you know, in the U.S., there's also been a lot of developments, and I think we have to sort of acknowledge those. We do acknowledge them. They write about them every day on the front page of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, so it's not a secret, and the Chinese know about it. But I think it's important for, for us to think about these things. Um, a lot of people are saying in the U.S. that our engagement policy with uh, China, the one that we pursued beginning with Nixon and for the last 40 years, um, is a failure because it failed to bring about democracy in China. And, um, you know, because of that, you know, we have these delusional ideas that our engagement with China would turn it into a polity that would look, you know, a lot more like the U.S. governing system. Because that didn't happen, you know, we should write off the last 40 years and chalk it up as a loss. Um, I certainly don't believe that this is correct. Um, but I think it does go beyond that, really. 
um, because it seems in the U.S. we have lost some confidence in our principles and our system in the face of Chinese competition and Chinese, you know, the performance of China's economy and its system has, has created a seed of doubt in our minds. Um, and, and currently there are people in the U.S. who seem to think that rolling back globalization will serve U.S. interests. Um, and, you know, I think it's true that globalization has brought about certain excesses and inequities, but certainly no one can deny the tremendous progress that has happened under, you know, the last sort of at least 20 years of this, of this globalization process that the U.S. has led and promoted. Um, and it's not just the Chinese or the economic miracle in Asia. I mean, it's this technology revolution is really has as much to do with globalization as any foreign country, and that is technology that originated here in the United States. So we should we should think about these things before we um, we, we leap too quickly to worry about the shortcomings. Um, I think you know deglobalization is certainly not in America's interest. We are the original globalist society. I mean, we um, brought globalization to the world. We can adapt better to dislocations, we can, we have a flexible and resilient society um, and system, and so to me the biggest uh, danger is that we're going to abandon this international system that we built um, and that we, and that we will fail to keep China in this international, you know, system of, of norms and rules um, that we worked so hard to get them into in the first place. Um, and so I think, you know, this system actually is going to be more important to the U.S. going forward than it has been over the last 20 years. Because, you know, as we go forward with the international system and the changing power alignments, emerging economies, I mean, the U.S.'s weight in that system, even though we won't be in decline and we'll still be the most powerful player, it won't be as large and disproportionately large as it has been. And so the international system is going to protect us um, more as time goes on. And we, if, we, if we think about abandoning it or um, sort of, you know, dissing it now, I think that that is a huge uh, mistake. Um, I think the excesses of globalization can certainly need to be addressed and can certainly be addressed through uh, changes and reforms and additions and subtractions and also, uh, you know, we have to get China involved in that. We have to get them to change things, reform things, join certain things, obey certain rules, change certain behaviors. And the international system is going to help us to do that. It's very hard for us to do that unilaterally. Um, and we can talk more about that in the q and if you would like to. Um, you know, I work now at the Yale Law School's China Center. since. The mid 90s, um, our center has had an extensive program with China on uh, modernizing its legal system, changing its laws, first in the area of commercial law and then in the area of kind of um, criminal law and other kinds of administrative law. And this is the area, one of the areas in China that our US companies complain about the most. Um, and in China, it's true, they lack. Uh, a well-honed and functioning legal system. And so you can imagine the trouble that comes from a country like the United States where we have more lawyers than we can count runs into a system like China where all they do is lock up their lawyers. Um, and you know it doesn't seem to really, uh, these two systems don't seem to really speak to each other very well. But, but, but we had made, I mean, and have made and are continuing to make tremendous progress. Um, China is a country that wants to be seen as a responsible player in the international system. They sit on the UN Security Council, Council's uh, permanent five veto-wielding members, which means they're in on almost all of the decision-making, all of the crucial um, negotiating that goes on on all the issues in the UN and all of its institutions. They're one of the major shareholders in all of the international financial institutions now, and the, and the IMF and the World Bank, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, um, we have managed to get them to buy into the system that the U.S. built after World War II, which was not an easy thing. 
Um, it serves our interests, it serves China's interests, and it serves the interests of the other countries, especially smaller and, and middle, medium-sized countries. It helps them have an equal say in the international system so they don't get pushed around by the big guys. That's kind of why we set up the system after World War I and World War II. But, um, you know, this is a very valuable, um, and, and, it, and also um, the international system gives the U.S. incredible um, influence and soft power you know, around the world, these institutions that we've set up and that we've led. So I hope you get my point that I'm a big fan of the international system and I'm also uh, a big fan of multilateral efforts to contain bad actors in the international system. I think those have been very successful in a lot of different cases. They haven't solved everything. But um, we can come back to that because there are a lot of skeptics out there in, uh, in the U.S., um, especially in the White House today, about the um, you know, uh, efficacy of such efforts, and I'd be happy to talk more about that. Um, but in my experience, I would say that, um, and I said this to a group yesterday, and they, questioned, they came back and questioned me, and so I welcome that. I said that um, basically it is... You can get progress in negotiations with China. Um, and I find them actually, the Chinese officials that I've dealt with, um, to be difficult um, to husband their information very tightly, but to be pragmatic and to be motivated to solve problems, which is not the case with some of the other actors like North Korea that I've negotiated with. So, so I think. You know, we've gotten progress with China over the last 40 years. We can negotiate with them. They want to solve problems. Sometimes it takes a little longer. Uh, sometimes we have to educate each other on our two systems. But this is the way I think um, that we should be uh, going. And I, and I hope in our impatience and our frustration with the negotiating process, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, so I guess the question after looking at sort of these two uh, you know, what What the changes have been in China, the changes have been in the U.S., we've brought ourselves to this great point in the relationship, what should we do now? Um, you know, personally, you know, rather than being destined for war, or rather than entering into a new Cold War, which I and many of you lived through, and we can talk about, um, you know, the, the, the aspects of that that would be relevant in this case, but... Um, I spent a lot of time studying the Soviet Union um, in the first part of my career. Um, I, I think U.S. interests will best be served by, over the long term, by having constructive cooperation with China. China's damaging and coercive behaviors, of course, need to be curbed. And that can best be done through collective action. Um, I'm a big proponent of banding together with the European Union and Japan and other partners and allies around the world to um, form a united front that, that puts back on bad behavior from, from any country. But certainly, in the case of China, because of its weight, we need to do it together. And that'll be a much better recipe than the sort of unilateral approach that we're taking, I think, right now. Um, we can, I think, can compete effectively with China um, uh, while we allow China the space that it, that it rightly seeks to grow. I think that's um, sort of an existential issue for China. They, they want to be able to continue to grow their economy. Um, and I think it, it, China also seeks to expand its influence around the world. You know, and, and I think they will seek to do that, and I think they're a sovereign state that has a right to try to do that. I personally, having lived in China for a long time, knowing it pretty well, not as well as some of you in the audience probably, but pretty well, um, I think China will probably make a lot of mistakes as it embarks on this journey. I mean, most countries have and most countries do when they're going through this process, and China's, uh, you know, governance is not as nimble and resilient as um, it should be in order to you know, make do everything right the first time. That's definitely not going to happen. Uh, we can see already some of the blowback that's coming uh, back on China from some of its missteps in various areas, like the um, Belt and Road Initiative and, and some other some you know this 
political internal interference in uh, various countries like Australia and New Zealand. So I think, you know, we can handle China growing and um, moving out in the world as it is natural for it to do, and we don't need to be so afraid of it. Um, I think U.S. interests will be harmed, though, not just by conflict with China. I mean, obviously, everyone thinks we should avoid having a war with China. I think pretty much everyone agrees on that. But I think we will also damage our own interests if we are unable to <coughs> come around to accepting, psychologically maybe, a more powerful China, the notion that China will be more powerful. And if we fail to figure out a way to build a constructive relationship with China. So um, I think that will be more damaging to U.S. interests over the long term than, you know, than trying to, than, than not doing that. Um, so I think to devise a policy that, you know, would allow for a productive relationship with China, what we really need to do is look at what China wants. Um, and we need to figure out the priorities that we have, but we also need to consider that in the future, and, and this is kind of not really sunk in in Washington yet, but my own personal view is that the problems of the future are not going to be U.S.-China problems. Most of the problems, and we've seen this over the last couple of decades, so it's kind of odd that it's not that we see now everything in Washington through this bilateral relationship prism with major powers. Because most of the problems that have come our way in the last couple of decades have been transnational and non-state actor related. Um, I think some of the big problems in the future, I mean, and people are, are talking about them, thinking about them, and, and people outside of Washington actually talk more about these problems um, and, and these kinds of things matter more to people than a lot of things that people in Washington talk about, but it's things like you know health, food safety, um, uh, environmental degradation. Uh, uh, you know who's going to control technology? What's going to happen to my information? You know all of these things are very important in the daily lives of every person in this room, probably. And we all think about these things. And they all are vulnerable to um, interference or threat from non-state actors. I mean, control of technology. Are we going to let multinational corporations control technology? Are governments going to do it? Are terrorists going to do it? Are criminals going to do it? Are, is there going to be some non-governmental organization that we all agree on that's going to do it? I mean, these are very important questions. Um, I think, uh, you know, I um, my talk about relying on multilateral diplomacy and, and the talk about transnational threats reminds me that, that you know, I think diplomacy is actually um, the way to go in solving a lot of these problems. Um, it's slow. It's boring. It doesn't catch a lot of headlines these days. Um, but it takes advantage of the U.S. Um, skills and advantages in leadership, in coalition building, in values, and in soft power. And it's really cheap. It's a lot cheaper than you know fighting a long war in uh, either South Asia or the Middle East or in East Asia. And so. Um, you know, I, I can talk about this in the Q&A, but if people in this room are interested in the Foreign Service, the Diplomatic Corps, working at the State Department, um, this is, you know, a future growth opportunity, I predict. Because we're not going to have money to keep doing it the way we've been doing it. So, you know, if you're interested in that, please um, come up to me at the end of the talk, and I'd, I'd love to encourage more people to uh, go into diplomacy, the State Department, and the Foreign Service. It's a great life. Um, but Back to the co-evolutionary approach with China. First, let's look at what China wants. Um, I come up with four major priorities um, if you're looking at the world through the Chinese leadership's eyes. My number one priority is stability. First and, forth, first and foremost, internal stability, and second, external stability, my periphery. You know, China has more land borders than any other country in the world. And those land borders are with countries like Tajikistan, North Korea, Russia, Mongolia, 
um, Laos, Cambodia, it's not a great neighborhood. So they worry a lot about what's happening in their neighborhood. They also worry a lot, as I mentioned, about um, the sort of way that the leaders look at internal stability. They worry a lot about that, too. So that's number one, probably number one, two, and three. Number two, of course, is we hear a lot about China's leadership's um, priority for continued economic growth. Uh, actually, most people put this as number one. I don't think that's right. I think stability, 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 and then economic growth because that gives us stability. Um, number three, the Chinese want and crave international respect and legitimacy for their governance model um, and for their state. I mean, let's be clear. Uh, China conceives of itself as, as you know, the Middle Kingdom. It's a very self-regarding polity, like some others we might know. Um, and so I think um, this is very important. It doesn't get mentioned much, but it's really important that you consider that because um, sort of respect in their system and, if, and in general um, in the international system, I think is more important than people give it credit for. And then number four, of course, is the consolidation of national borders. So that means you know China has, like I mentioned that half the country has like 1.3 billion of the population and 0.1 billion lives in the whole western part of China. Those are mostly areas with some restive minority populations. So the Chinese feel very uncomfortable about Tibet, about Xinjiang, and we've been reading a lot about that in the press recently, the horrifying sort of uh, incarceration of a large proportion of this Muslim Uyghur minority in Western China. Um, Hong Kong, the Chinese are very sensitive still about Hong Kong, even though they got it back from the Brits in 97. One country, two systems. It's not completely smooth. Um, the South China Sea I mentioned earlier. And of course Taiwan. Um, it's quite remarkable actually, and, and maybe we should, we should think about what this means, but it's quite remarkable. When I first started working on China, almost all the issues I dealt with focused on Taiwan because it was the most sensitive issue in U.S.-China relations, and you know there were all kinds of <coughs> Chinese worries about what was happening with Taiwan and um, what was going on there. Um, but as the U.S.-China relationship has come, become so much more complex and intertwined, uh, really, the issue of Taiwan is still there. It's still, you know, the clear one place where the U.S. and China could get into a hot war, but it, it doesn't come up as much in the conversation. So, um, but it's it's definitely still there, and it's in this priority basket for the Chinese for sure. Um, now, there are areas in this list where obviously the U.S. and China have problems and differences. But looking at it from the Chinese perspective, I think we could all agree that this is, you know, from their national interest perspective, this is a reasonable list of things for a government uh, to be concerned about. Um, you know, certainly none of these issues, none of these priorities for China, for the Chinese leadership, is going to change in the medium to longer term. Uh, these are going to continue to be the things that the Chinese government cares about. Um, that. <laughs> Uh, so maybe to explore about sort of where we might be able to develop cooperation or co-evolution, we should look at these and ask whether there's any unexploited space there for convergence that we've overlooked for cooperation, etc. So if we look at the, at the list, um, of course on stability, I mean, we both want an internally stable China. I think we can all agree on that. If we don't agree, we can talk about it in the question and answer session afterwards. But I think. Internally stable China is something that most U.S. administrations have believed and determined is in the interests of the United States. Um, and we certainly want a peaceful and stable East Asia Pacific region. So that's something that at least we have common interests on. We ought to be able to think about um, you know, can, you know, how we work on that together or at least talk about it. Uh, number two, of course, we want both our economies to continue to grow, to be engines of global growth and to um, continue to sort of lead the rest of the world and uh, find new pockets of um, dynamism in the, in the international economic system. Um, so the third one was that question, remember, about legitimacy. 
um, and that they want respect. And so here, I mean, I would like to put a question to you all, which is the question of whether or not um, the United States should consider according China, um, you know, respect and concede that the Chinese Communist Party's governance is legitimate, whether or not we think that it is the best system, and whether or not we think it's sustainable over the long term, because I would bet that we would all say that we think it's maybe not the best system, and maybe it's not even sustainable over the long term. But is it is it something that we could recognize as legitimate? Um, and I, I would just note here, parenthetically, that this is something that President Trump seems to have accorded North Korea in the process of diplomatic, the recent diplomatic outreach to North Korea. So that's something to think about. Um, there's a lot to talk about in that question, but um, you know we can we can get to it in the question and answer. Uh, the fourth area, you know, are we willing to accept changes to the international system? And can we work with China to undertake those reforms and changes? I think that's clearly in our interest. I think China would be interested in doing that with us. And it's just a matter of figuring out what each each uh, player is about. Can you guys hear me? Should I talk louder? Battery <laughs> time. OK. Yeah. How's that? Okay. It's going to crib my hand signals if I have to do it this way, but that's OK. Um, so I think um, you know this question of international system working together, I think in, there's an area that the Chinese are unhappy about that we will not be able to come to. There are a couple of them, areas that they're unhappy about that we won't be able to really easily resolve. One of them is that they're unhappy about the dominance of the dollar in the US, in the global financial system. Um, and I think that's just something that um, you know is going to continue because that's that's actually the, U the dollar denominated global financial system is not going to probably be changing anytime soon. But the Chinese are are certainly unhappy with the way we've been wielding that stick in the international arena recently in the, in the form of sanctions and other other sort of unilateral coercive measures. Um, they're very unhappy about the U.S. security posture and alliance system in the East Asia Pacific region. They feel that it's aimed at them, that it um, is aimed at containing them, and that it's a, it's threatening to them. And so they're very unhappy about that. I don't think that we're probably going to be able to, um, you know, make a lot of uh, convergence or um, progress on that. But um, it's important, I think, to note them because I think there may be the possibility of uh, coming up with some arrangement or institution that we could strengthen now that would hedge against these things turning into real problem areas in the future. And here I'm thinking about things like arms control arrangements or um, crisis management mechanisms that we should, should think about um, so that we don't have these problem areas turn into real, real problem areas. Um, so let me turn now to um, a few areas where I think if the U.S. and China could get on a more constructive path, maybe after we finish these trade negotiations and move on to um, even tougher issues, um, let me let me spin through a few areas where I think if we're being creative and visionary, we could see U.S.-China cooperation benefiting the U.S. more than it does now. Uh, this is in the vein of looking for the opportunities here in U.S.-China relations. So the first one I have is domestic governance. That's going to sound very strange to you. But I will say, and if you've been to China, you've seen these huge mega cities: Shanghai, 25 million people, Beijing, 25, 30 million people. Um, Chinese have been making progress on technocratic governance in improving people's satisfaction with government services in these huge mega cities. Um, they obviously have extensive innovation and experience in managing these cities. And I think um, they're doing things like using automated systems to register and resolve certain kinds of court cases. This is probably unimaginable and certainly bad news for you know, US lawyers that we talked about earlier. But um, but it's you know it's interesting and it's probably something that we could 
investigate and, and learn from and think about uh, in this country and try to be more responsive to uh, in, in the area of government services and, and actually strengthen um, you know people's faith in this country in the fact that government can be responsive to their problems because I think we have some problems with that maybe right now. Um, the second one is um, East Asia security. So I mentioned that for 40 years of normalization of relations between the U.S. and China, there have been no conflicts, serious conflicts, in East Asia. Uh, you know, states in the region have been able to balance economic dependency on China with the U.S. security umbrella, and have that way avoided falling prey to pressure tactics. I think this state of affairs will need to continue. Um, I think China's going to have to evolve to see the value of the continuing constraining effects of the U.S. security presence in East Asia. And the U.S. is going to have to evolve in figuring out how we can respect legitimate Chinese security concerns, whether that's through some kind of agreements or um, some kind of assurances or whatever. But I think this is a very difficult area. Um, it's, it's an area we've been struggling with for a long time, but I think um, over time, with goodwill on both sides and with a more constructive atmosphere, we could address and, and, and make this area more stable. And, and I, I'm pretty worried about it right now, actually. Um, those crisis management mechanisms, we're trying to get some things stood up <laughs> in order to make sure that uh, we have them in place. Um, Obviously, DPRK, denuclearization, which I'd be happy to talk about in the Q&A session, is an area for clear cooperation between the U.S. and China, and we've been cooperating with China on that issue. President Trump has talked about it repeatedly in his, in his tweets and in his meetings and his public statements. Um, there's a lot more China can be doing on this issue to help us, uh, but that's an obvious area where we can be working with them. Uh, uh, the economy, I mean, Asia is the future of global growth, and China and the U.S. can both make tremendous gains or we can engender tremendous setbacks, depending on whether or not we can co-evolve in this international economic trade and investment arena. It's what we're trying to do right now with this trade negotiation. We're trying very hard, I think, to push China to to do more to get back to the reform and opening that we, you know, had counted on and that they told us they were going to do in the WTO accession agreement. Um, you know, and once we have this trade deal done, let me just say, this will not be the end. We have been negotiating with China on trade and investment always and forever. <laughs> and we will always have problems. I mean, we can't, we have problems with Canada. Um, talk to the dairy farmers in Maine about milk prices. Um, we, we will have a lot of trade problems with China. You know, as long as there's China and as long as there's a U.S. and we have economies, we will have these problems. But um, we have to continue to negotiate, continue to talk to them, continue to make progress, and I think we can do that. I think we also, um, in addition to pushing China on these reforms, and, and as I mentioned earlier, getting our allies and partners together with us to push them, we, we should, and we should have, and this was a major strategic blunder, we should have joined the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. That was set up as a competitive kind of institution to the WTO with high standards that would have created um, a, a large trading block of dynamic economies with high standards that would have been an attractive magnet to to countries like China that are that are um, sort of you know having unfair trade practices, unlevel playing field, etc. So this was really, I think, uh, unfortunate that we couldn't make that work. I don't think the American people really understood it very clearly. Um, we we uh, I think the Obama administration pursued it too late in his administration. Um, but you know, I think most people believe that. If you took the Trans-Pacific Partnership and combined it with the TTIP, which is the agreement that we were going to have high standards with Europe, and got the, all those high standards economies together in one trade agreement, 
you could get the WTO reforms that we need to get in order to fix the international trading system and make it fair and uh, level playing field for, for United States workers and companies. And I think that would be an incredible accomplishment. And I think China would, would um, they would be upset about Trans-Pacific Partnership. They were at the time. But they would see that you know this is an aspirational target for them to hit. And if they're going to be competitive in the international economy, they would have to join and, and move toward joining. And that would be beneficial to everyone. Um, on technology and cyber, this is um, an area of major concern to most of the people in the national security community, in the China watching community, and elsewhere. It's a looming source of tension, obviously, in the in disagreement in the US-China relationship. Um, but you know, I think, and I'm not a technologist, I find myself at a grave disadvantage in all of these conversations, but um, I think that as the two biggest users of technology, um, whose populations are the most reliant on you know, all of these devices and all of our systems are tied to these devices, I think the US and China are going to have to cooperate on many aspects of technological control and development, um, including standards and regulation, emergency responses, international norms for protecting <coughs> critical infrastructure, um, and all of this. So right now, China is out there making the standards on a lot of this stuff because the United States isn't in the conversation. Uh, China has taken a leading role in a lot of international organizations to do this kind of thing, and the U.S. is sitting it out, and that's a very bad position for us to be in. So I um, am a big advocate for at least talking more to China about what the possibilities are for cooperation in this area, because right now we're kind of left out of the information loop. Um, International governance, I mentioned we need to find a way to help work with China to reform international institutions and make them more um, vibrant, more dynamic, and more resilient. And I think there are a lot of areas that China is interested in doing this. There's a lot of areas where the U.S. wants to fix things in the U.N. and elsewhere. And I think a lot of, we would find a lot of common ground on that. China has recently surprised us by being frustrated with our inability to work with them on changing institutions, so they've gone ahead and created a couple of their own. I don't know if those efforts are going to be uh, successful or if they're going to be um, in the cost-benefit analysis if it's going to work out for China. But in any case, it's better to have us working with China to fix the institutions that we build and that we lead and that embody our values that have them creating a separate parallel system. I think that will be very bad, as I talked about earlier. On uh, global threats, I talked about the areas where we can work, and we are working with China now still on things like environment, disease. I mean, the Chinese have a rapidly aging population. Um, you know, I think uh, half, they have twice as many people, I think, coming in over the age of 65 that we do. And so they are going to have um, you know, huge issues coming along with this. They haven't faced before. And there's a lot that the US could um, get involved with with China. And this year, we have a lot of experience in, um, in dealing with various healthcare areas. And I think that could be a very dynamic uh, area of cooperation. Um, so in conclusion, I just want to end where I started. I, I, the US sees itself as the land of opportunity. And we've always seen China as an opportunity as well. Um, we find ourselves now in this crisis. Interestingly, the Chinese word for crisis, Wenji, is a combination of two Chinese characters, one that means threat and one that means opportunity. We always used to laugh about this on the China desk at the State Department uh, and make jokes about it. You know, oh, it's a, it's a crisis, but it's really an opportunity. But I mean, I think actually um, it's kind of smart, and I, I think you know, I've, I've outlined this vision for co-evolution that sounds fantastical in the current environment that we have in U.S.-China relations. It may be sounding very optimistic to some, but there's so much overlap in U.S. and Chinese interests that I think, um, you know, the, in order to get the progress that we want to see in our own two countries and in the, in the broader global community, we are going to have to uh, imagine a shared future where we can both be successful. And I think that's half the battle. We're not being very imaginative right now. Um, 
you know, work between the U.S. and China is continuing in a lot of these areas, as I mentioned, combating disease. A lot of that work is just going on uh, between Chinese and U.S. researchers. And if we cut ourselves off from each other um, and fail to pursue these efforts to communicate and work together, I think we'll be foregoing major, major opportunities. And in this vein, I would just like to commend to you, uh, some of you may know this story, um, but there's a person named Chen Shui Sun, um, who's also known as the father of China's nuclear program. And you can Google father of China's nuclear program if you're interested in more information on this. But just in brief, um, Chen was a brilliant physicist um, at Caltech in the 1940s. Uh, he advanced the U.S. rocket program, served in the U.S. Army in World War II, um, and after Mao's victory in China in 1949, he was caught up in the um, McCarthyist, anti-communist fervor in the U.S. and was one of the only people in U.S. history ever to be ordered, deported, and at the same time simultaneously um, yeah, and prevented from departing the U.S. because he was such a valuable uh, national security asset. So they imprisoned him in an island off the coast of California for several years uh, until he could be exchanged in a prisoner exchange with China. And he was welcomed as a hero back home in China and became the father of the Chinese nuclear program, um, you know, in the subsequent decades and never returned to the United States. So I think, you know, this is something that we all have to remember. We have these episodes in our past where we've made huge mistakes and blunders that damaged our own long-term interests. And that is what we should be keeping in the, in the front of our minds as we think about the U.S.-China relationship, I think, going forward. So thank you very much for listening to all of us. Thanks very much, Susan Thornton. That was uh, very informative. <laughs> you gave us an awful lot of information, a lot of insights. And uh, let me ask you a few questions before we open it up to uh, the audience. I noticed that some of our students have the urge to leave. That is not necessary. <laughs> um, you can your questions later. <laughs> um, you worked for both the Obama administration and the Trump administration. And under Obama, we had the pivot to Asia. Now we have the trade war, maybe strategic rivalries. So is there really a lot of difference between what, or between the China policy of the Obama administration and the current China policy? What are the differences and similarities? Um, well, you know, I think what President Obama was trying to do. It was sort of competing impulses. The, the pivot to Asia was really something that we've been trying to do actually since the 90s. I think early on in the 90s it was identified in, in the, in the post-Soviet collapse world that we were expending too many resources on Europe and the Middle East and not enough on Asia, which in the 90s everyone could see that was going to be the sort of center of gravity for the for future, future global growth and, and dynamism and also potential security flashpoints. So we're constantly trying to move resources to Asia, constantly frustrated. And I think Obama's rebalance to Asia was a continuation of that recognition that we hadn't moved any resources and a continued effort to try to do that. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, so he was, he was trying to make sure that the U.S. remained engaged in Asia, had a major presence in Asia, could provide the balancing power that he thought we needed there. At the same time, um, he recognized, certainly after the global financial crisis in 2008, right when Obama came into office, he was faced with this massive meltdown of the, of the global economy. And, and the need on China, I mean, China was very instrumental in in stemming the bleeding on the global financial crisis, Obama created the G20. He had a very strategic idea of, you know, he wanted China to step up, stop being a free rider, contribute public goods to the international system, you know, and, and act more like a big player so that the 
U.S. wouldn't have to, you know, expend resources on, on in every single area. Peacekeeping in the U.N. Was a, was a major focus for him. Certainly climate change was another major focus. He wanted them to pay for and um, and contribute materially to the Iran nuclear deal, not just show up at the meetings, but actually come in and fix the, the nuclear reactor that was part of that deal, and had to sort of push and cajole, and, but, you know, the Chinese did reluctantly um, step up in a few of these areas. Whereas, you know, I mean, the, the, the Trump administration's approach, I think the Indo-Pacific strategy, um, continues the, the pivot to Asia and continues this effort to try to move resources to Asia for the same reasons that previous administrations have tried it. It's still not really happening. Um, and uh, I think, so that's the Indo-Pacific strategy. It's also an effort to try to make sure in an, um, in an era where China is developing militarily a much stronger posture in the region that we have enough um, sort of connections with various partners, enough assets, enough resources to remain engaged in Asia. But the, the difference really is in, I think, that, you know, it's the Trump administration is afraid of encouraging China to be, you know, a bigger power on the international stage. They're, they're, they see China's um, sort of advance and growth in leadership as threatening, as undermining, as uh, nefarious, not everyone in the Trump administration sees that, and I want to here just note that I think um, that it's very confusing for people, for countries. You know, I worked at the State Department. It was very hard for our partners in foreign countries to figure out what the policy was in the Trump administration. So that's another um, aspect to it. Of course, everyone knows that Trump uh, the the trade deficits are a major focus. People have caught on to that, but I think. Uh, in some of these other areas, it's very hard for for us to really figure out what exactly the policy is. I think uh, the term uh, uh, containment has been banded about. Do you think that is correct, or is that uh, an exaggeration? Well, there are certainly some people in the current administration that have that kind of lens when they when they look at China. They're thinking about that. You know, oh, we made a mistake. You know, engagement was a failure. It was a um, a misstep. We shouldn't have been. You know, helping China to become stronger, to grow, we need to do th something now to sort of make up for that mistake and to try to curtail because you know we've created a monster. But I don't think that that's the um, sort of overriding impulse of the Trump administration. Um, I think you know there are some people that think that and, and, and <laughs> act in, in that vein, but I don't think that that's U.S. policy, so to speak. Thank you. You call for constructive cooperation. And in principle, I think most people would agree with that. But there are serious problems like intellectual property theft. The Europeans and the Americans essentially agree that there is a basic problem. So what do we do with that within that overall framework of constructive cooperation? Well, I mean, this is an area that we've been fighting with China for a long, long time. I'm sure the ambassador had lots of conversations about intellectual property theft when you were out in Beijing. and. And the whole time I've been working on China, this has been a prominent uh, theme. You know, we make progress on some of these issues, but then new issues crop up. And so I think we, you know, have to continue to insist um, that, you know, China abide by international rules and norms, um, push them to make these structural changes. And here I think, you know, the Trump administration's tactics, I don't agree with all of them on the trade negotiations, but I think making the trade um, you know, problems of priority has gotten the Chinese attention, and that, in my experience, is what you need to do in order to get progress. And so, hopefully, we can, you know, capitalize on this leverage that we've built up through, you know, the various things that have happened, the tariffs, the trade war, etc., and get some real um, kind of improvements in this area. It's not going to be easy. Thank you. Some analysts have argued that the South China Sea is essentially lost lost to uh, Chinese dominance and privacy, whether or not a few freedom of navigation in, uh, uh, excursions take place or not. Would you agree with that or is that, again, an exaggeration? I don't think I agree with that because the main thing that we need to preserve in the South China Sea is freedom of navigation. I mean, that is an international waterway. It's a huge, vital shipping lane. And, um, I mean, the Chinese would tell you that they're just as 
interested in keeping it open for navigation as anyone else because all of their you know commercial goods move through there and you know they view the uh, you know sort of vulnerability of the South China Sea and the Straits of Malacca as a as a security issue for them so I think the point is to try to make sure that nobody has the wherewithal to close down or the motivation to close down those shipping lanes um, the, the issues about the maritime claims and the conflicting maritime claims and the exploitation of resources in the South China Sea those are going to continue to be disputed I don't anticipate that will be uh, resolved anytime soon, but as long as those can be managed and the freedom of navigation and the international waterways are kept open, I think those are the main issues that um, need to be focused on. Is that a rather dangerous enterprise? Could a clash or you know, something along Graham Allison's line uh, occur? The, there's an awful lot of uh, ships, submarines, and airplanes moving around in the South China Sea right now, and so I mentioned that I'm concerned about a potential accident leading to escalation I think crisis management is going to be very important for escalation control because you don't want a minor um, you know military accident to turn into a full-blown you know conflict between the US and China and so that's those are things that are people are working on now but we need to do more okay. <laughs> let me ask you one final question before we open it up and that is North Korea you also work on the North Korea problem and what we're all interested in is, uh, is North Korea going to denuclearize any time soon? No. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, I, my, I maybe have a kind of a provocative or off, offbeat view on this. I, I give President Trump a lot of credit for making the diplomatic opening to North Korea because really only he could do it. And it's very hard to get progress with North Korea at any level below the leader level. So it's a it's a high risk, high stakes approach. But actually, President Trump, uh, because of his unique style, he's created a lot more political space to do this kind of thing, and he's taking advantage of it and seeing if he can get you know change it up and and see if he can get some uh, progress. Uh, I personally think that. Kim Jong-un is not going to denuclearize unless he absolutely has to, uh, unless you know his security depends on it. And we haven't reached that point yet. And we're in a period of testing. You know, it's a new leader. He may have different ideas about how to do things, and we need to test because he said that he'll do this, or he said something like that at least. We need to test and see what it is he's actually talking about, what he's willing to do, and whether that's um, worth paying for, and whether it's beneficial to our own security or the security of our allies, and then, uh, well, we haven't really gotten to that point. I think we're still basically in the pre-negotiation phase. We haven't, and, and talking to North Korea is, is the biggest problem that we have in, in getting anywhere with them. I mean, they, they won't meet with us. They they control. They have. They're in the driver's seat. They control the pace, the scope, the timing, the location, everything of the meetings. Um, you don't get into much substance in the meeting. So this is a familiar kind of pattern. And I think it's a bad sign that we're falling back into familiar patterns with Kim Jong-un because this whole effort was premised on the notion that he's different from his father and his grandfather. And maybe now we're seeing that either his bureaucracy is constraining him or he's not really different. And it, it, the longer this goes on this way, the, the, the worse sign it is for something you know, serious to happen. I, I, I personally think that um, if he's willing to give up a significant chunk of his nuclear program, we ought to talk about that very seriously because, you know, it, it seems like that might be what, where this is headed. And if the price is right, I would say that it improves U.S. security to get rid of a huge part of their nuclear complex. We should think about that. Kim's meeting was Putin this week, I think. Is that a good sign or is it negative for American? Probably a bad sign. But, but he's going to do this kind of thing. He's going to um, he's going to shop around. He's going to flirt with you know the other girls to try to make us jealous. And, and this is this is standard operating procedure for the North Koreans. So. President Trump, you will become jealous, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to you any questions, please? Um, uh, okay, this gentleman here was waving then the right shirt. Uh, thanks to Sam. So, it's all. It's all. Yeah, okay, it's all. So, um, thank you for sharing us so many 
very positive. Please speak up loudly. Yeah. Okay. Good job. Okay. Can you identify yourself too? Yeah. Okay. So I'm working at Duke. So I'm I'm here as a postdoc. So um, I I really appreciate it today. You can share us with so many um, uh, your own personal um, uh, perspective, and uh, I hope everyone, most majority of people here, will agree with you because you understand China very well from my own persp perspective. So, and uh, I was born in China in a small town in the country. So this year I went back to China for one month and then came back. One thing I just want to say here, as I don't see the Chinese American people to, here to be afraid of the, the China to be the, we are competing with the United States. I don't think this will happen in the next 10 years or 20 years. I think that China still has a lot of problems. As you just said, the top, prior, uh, the top prior, uh, priority is the stability. Can you, can you try to ask a question? Yeah, so I, I, I don't want to ask a question, I just want to share some kind of my own perspective. <laughs> no, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. We really need uh, uh, questions to be asked. This lady that was... Um, um, yeah. Thank you so much for your wonderful speech. And I have a quick question. Uh, what do you think of the relations, the future relationship between China and the United States in five years? Thank you. What is the relationship like between, will it be like uh, between the U.S. and China in five years' time? Be a prophet. Yeah, I don't have a crystal ball, but I hope it's along the lines that I outlined there. Some kind of co-evolution that will allow the U.S. and China to get into a more constructive pattern and work on things together so that we can take advantage of opportunities that arise. And I think there'll be a lot of them. Thank you. Uh, have an optimistic view. Of course. Oh, good. <laughs> the gentleman over there. Yeah. Hi, but A very quick and uh, short question. Hypothetical. If you were a Chinese president, what would you uh, like to do to improve the relationship with the U.S.? That's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> wow, if I was the Chinese president, I would probably do a lot of things. But um, So first thing I think that needs to be done is we need to get a good trade deal done soon, as soon as possible. I think that's very important because um, it will send a signal of uh, <coughs> confidence to you know, people around the world, but especially the American people, that China takes seriously our complaints because these are long-standing grievances and a lot of people in this country feel like China has broken its promises about moving toward a market economy and that it's really moving backwards and that you know this is somehow not going to be a bridgeable gap. So I think getting the trade deal, um, getting a good trade deal that U.S. business and the U.S., you know, body politic can support and feel good about, um, that's really important. I know a lot of businesses are hurting because of this trade war. I hear people complaining about it where I am up in Maine. I heard it yesterday in Michigan. And, and so I think, um, you know, that will help a lot. Um, second, you know, I think that China should do something about the situation in Xinjiang. Yeah. Because that really... Uh, makes it impossible for people who want to move on a more constructive path with China. It makes it impossible for them to defend, um, you know, the Chinese government. And people in China don't understand this. I think, you know, they think, oh, we're just trying to do a terrorism prevention program. You know, we're trying to help people. They might think um, we have this minority that's threatening. We have to do something about it. I mean, putting people large numbers of people in camps is very uh, evocative for Americans of very dark periods in not only not only uh, world history but also our own history. It's, it's a very difficult thing for anybody to um, to accept and it's a real badge of shame I think for the Chinese government. So those two things are things that I would do right away. But can you explain that a little bit further? Because also the United States fights against fundamentalist terrorism. You can say has a certain paranoia about that. Why would they not understand the Chinese paranoia? Well, how can you explain to the Chinese that, that, that the Americans don't? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, everybody's slightly paranoid about terrorism, and, and there's reasons to be so. I mean, we've seen some horrific attacks. and But, you know, you've got to have some basis for suspicion of um, you know somebody being a terrorist there has to be some judicial process there has to be some evidence um, and you can't just you know take a whole 
class of people and ethnicity or whatever and move them into camps. I mean, that's, that's you know, putting people in concentration camps is not something that anyone in this country or most countries can defend in, in, at all. And we can't understand actually even how it's going to be remotely effective So if, for tackling the problem, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, over there, the center of that, and the blue shirt, yeah. Thank you, Susan. Uh, until six years ago, uh, when I retired, I described my knowledge and understanding of Chinese and U.S. relations and positions, relative positions in the world order as, uh, let's say, innocently ignorant. In the last six years, I've learned a lot, and what opened my eyes tremendously uh, was a book I picked up, written by one of your Washington colleagues, I'm sure you're familiar with Michael Pillsbury's 100-year marathon, China's secret strategy to replace America as the world's dominant power. I'm wondering to the degree you subscribe to what Michael has, has posited, and also your Washington colleagues. And if that's true, if you do, then that throws kind of a shadow on China ever being a positive player in the sandbox. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Michael Pillsbury's book is, of course, well known, and he's seen as some kind of advisor to President Trump, although I'm not sure to the extent that that's actually the case. But, um, you know, and he has this very uh, kind of um, rigid view uh, based on his reading of Chinese documents that there's this, as you said, 100-year secret plan to... Um, dominate the world, overthrow the United States, and um, be on the march to um, progress. And I think most China watchers are quite skeptical of this. Um, most people that have lived in China, I don't know if Michael Pillsbury has ever lived in China, but um, most people um, are quite, that have lived in China are quite skeptical of, um, you know, stated Chinese plans, slogans, and, um, you know, I mean, people all seem to think that China has this very well honed long-term strategy machine. And I think it partly comes from our own insecurity about our ability to look past the end of the day. Um, we're quite, you know, short-term thinking here in the U.S. We have a four-year administration cycle. We have congressmen that rotate every two years. And so it's a very short-term kind of thinking that you tend to get in the U.S. And so we look with longing at the Chinese system that allows for, and now Xi Jinping got rid of um, the rules for term limits, so maybe he's going to stay for life, and that allows him to have an even longer-term plan. But, you know, the thing about plans is that reality intervenes. And, um, yeah, it's the same is true for China. They've got 1.4 billion people. They've got... I think I mentioned some of the problems, the internal problems that they're grappling with, um, and certainly they have a lot of external problems that they're grappling with. And I think, uh, you know, the Chinese have a lot of security concerns, and they do see the United States as a threat. Um, I was told at a recent conference where we had a Chinese um, counterpart there that you know, people were talking about the adversarial relationship between the U.S. and China right now, and he said, you know, we don't see the U.S. as an adversary. We see you as a threat. Um, and I said to him, well, we don't see you as an adversary either, but we see you as a threat. And so, you know, that's interesting because, um, like I said, I think we've normally seen China as an opportunity, and now a lot of people are seeing China as a threat to the United States. Some people are calling it an existential threat to the United States. I think that's ridiculous but um, people are saying things like that. We should ask ourselves why we see, the United, uh, why we see China as a, as a threat. And we should ask ourselves why does China see us as a threat. We don't think we're a threat to China, I don't think. Um, so, but this is, this is a kind of a dangerous cycle that we're getting ourselves into. Thank you. Ambassador Litt. Sure. How do you think China is going to react to the announcement of Secretary Pompeo that the United States will no longer, as of next month, tolerate any uh, imports of, uh, of uh, Iranian oil? Um, and uh, what will be the impact on, for example, the trade talks? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think. 
I've been through a lot of things like this with the Chinese, and you would be surprised the extent to which they will try to, um, you know, behave within the boundaries that the U.S. administration is seeking on this. Uh, I think, and you know, this is a new. This is a we're in a new era now, and this is an issue that they are particularly prickly about, so I can't guarantee that. But what I've seen in the past is that, you know, they are very, very to get crosswise with the U.S. on our financial sanctions because they have big companies, big state-owned oil companies that are operating in this space with Iran, and they don't want to uh, incur any kind of financial trouble with the SWIFT system or the U.S. banking system, etc. The Chinese have been importing gobs of oil from Iran and stockpiling it, waiting for this day to come, actually. So, you know, they've got a huge reserve built up, and my my guess is, and, and, they, and they do want to have an economic relationship with Iran. They don't think we're on the right side of history on this. They should think we should have stayed in the Iran nuclear deal. I agree with them on that point. Um, and so I think they will, um, you know, rely on their stockpile, try to reduce or cut their imports for a period of time, hope that the U.S. comes to its senses or something, and then they can start importing it. They need the oil. They're not going to be able to go at zero from Iran for a protracted period of time. And at the end of the day, the Chinese interest in their, you know, having fuel for their economy is going to outweigh whatever our uh, pleading is on the, on the Iran issue. But, but they will try to um, sort of work with us on this in the, in the near to medium term. When there is, if, when and if there is an agreement with the United States and the trade talks, could that include huge oil deliveries from the United States to China? I think it will probably include some energy deliveries. I'm not sure about oil, but I know that they're working on some energy deals. Um, you know, I, I don't think that the May, this recent announcement of going to zero is going to affect the trade talks, but it might factor into some of the energy considerations and other things in the trade talks, yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Go ahead. I would like your reactions to two recent personal experiences with the Chinese that I have had. I repeatedly receive solicitations for funds for a monumental uh, arrangement being made outside Junqing for the American World War II General Chennault. Obviously this is being done with the approval of the government, the current government, but General Chennault of course was very close to Chiang Kai-shek and he and members of his family were important in what was called the China lobby in this country which urged more support for Chiang Kai-shek in the Civil War. The other personal experience is that obviously only with the approval of the Communist government of China, there is going to be a Chinese edition of my general history of the Second World War. <coughs> and both of these uh, seem to reflect some attitudinal changes, possibly, <coughs> rather high up. Thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, you know, I, in my experience, I lived in Chengdu, so I spent quite a bit of time in Chongqing, actually. And in my experience in Chongqing, um, you know, the local population there, the local government there, they're very celebratory of the U.S.-China relationship during World War II. And they like to highlight that. There's a still war museum there. They love to talk about the Flying Tigers. Um, I have a colleague who, uh, for a World War II anniversary, did a, a tour and talked about the Flying Tigers and the history of the U.S.-China uh, alliance during World War II and all of the work that was done. And he got a high-level reception everywhere he went. He got into military academies to give lectures to soldiers that would never have been contemplated. So I think this is an area that 
um, maybe maybe China is increasingly looking to highlight as it's looking to try to find ways to right the U.S.-China relationship. And this is an area where they, you know, want to highlight our past cooperation. They talk about it quite a bit, actually. So, um, you know, I think um, the publication of the history on World War II is also in the same vein. And it's, a, it's an area that where we can highlight our past cooperation and remind Chinese people and American people that we have worked together a lot in the past on very important issues. And they do tend to play down the whole, this was before Mao Zedong's communist China part of the story. Um, so, uh, you know, much as they may not like to remember Chiang Kai-shek in other cases, in this kind of context, it's, it's fair game. Thank you. Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, let's think about a different kind of existential threat. For a long time after World War II, we maintained a series of policies which were in our interest, but in the interests of others as well, for our own interests. They violated almost all of our history up until that time, about how we were going to be in the world. And then the Soviet Union collapses, the fucking United States announced the possibility of a new world order, to use this word, uh, and we then proceed to walk away, step by step, over time, the entire architecture that got us to where we were. We are now, I think, not threatened so much by China, but by ourselves, and our failure to maintain any coherence in a foreign policy, you say four years, in this period, any two weeks. But more than that, what is it that we think is our job in the world now? Is there now a new world debate about who and what we're doing, or are we busy jumping around as though everything will go on? We may have to add that Bobby Carter worked in the State Department during the Carter administration, so... We were really from here. <laughs> <laughs> I got to see President Carter when I was down in Atlanta for the 40th anniversary of the normalization of relations in January, and it was just, he's just such a... I mean, it was, he's such an amazing guy, he survived brain cancer and was there giving a speech, you know, at this conference, and I mean, he, it was just really inspiring, so. Um, so, you know, I have Klaus here, my transatlantic friend, and we did have a chance to have a conversation over coffee before we started here, and I think, you know, certainly um, the lament that you expressed extends to most of my colleagues at the State Department, because we do feel that we're squandering this incredible treasure that we have in U.S. leadership. I mean, U.S. leadership is really still sought around the world. Um, there's a great demand signal for continued leadership, especially now. And, um, you know, China doesn't have that um, comparative advantage. You know, we have this incredible alliance network. Um, we have all of these institutions that we built that are based on you know, our value set and um, our principles and our system, openness, open society, open economy, capitalist market uh, competition. And, um, you know, to turn away from that is just squandering, you know, a huge resource that we're going to need now more than ever. So I, 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 I do support <laughs> the sentiment of your comment. And I, um, I think, you know, there are a lot of people working out there to try to preserve this, and I, I think that, you know, we will, with our transatlantic brethren and other partners around the world who are just waiting um, to see what's going to happen, but they're trying to keep everything going. Look at what the Japanese are do, have done with TPP. I talked about TPP. Uh, the Japanese, the Australians, um, other partners, Vietnam, all figured out how to preserve that agreement even though we pulled out and they're waiting for us to come back. So hopefully um, some of that will, will show itself in the future. I think we need to see you back in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> and what is back there in the back cringing? <laughs> <laughs> There's a time for some more questions. Yes, please. The lady here. Thank you. Uh, what do you think is the biggest the barrier um, about the China and the U.S. relationship? There is a saying that uh, the uh, city, the country city is different. The U.S. is capital, capitalism and China is socialism. 
Um, so this uh, is a, this a system uh, difference issue, but uh, China and the U.S. worked for 40 years on cooperation. Both countries went from, from the cooperation very much. So why suddenly you have this kind of problem? Thank you very much. What is the greatest barrier of cooperation between the U.S. and China after they have worked in the past together quite constructively? We have worked in the past quite constructively, but we've also had a lot of ups and downs and problems. And there's a great deal of mistrust. I think a lot of it comes from this kind of history and different systems. I would say, you know, China's modernization depends on it being part of the global community. That is the premise of engagement with China for the last 40 years. That's the premise of Deng Xiaoping's um, you know, reform and opening in China. And in order to fit China, which is huge, it's a colossus, into the global system, China has to make some compromises in, you know, in its own kind of vision of itself and its system and its righteousness in the world. Because you want to be part of a bigger uh, community now. And so, you know, obviously the rest of the community is going to have to fit China in too. The rest is going to have to sort of make some adjustments to fit China in. And we have an interest in fitting China in. It's going to help all of us. But China is going to have to follow the rules. And maybe, you know, China doesn't like some of the rules, so it's going to have to talk to us about which rules it doesn't like and wants to change and why. I will say that China has always been very interested in talking about how it wasn't there at the beginning and the creation of this system. And so it didn't make the rules, and now it's big, and it wants to make the rules. And so I say, okay, what rule is it that you want to make? What is it that you want to change? Well. They don't really know. They just want to make the rules. So if there's a specific thing um, that you don't like and you know you think should be changed and you have a legitimate reason that you can convince everyone in the community that, okay, they have a legitimate beef with this, then we can consider it. I think people are very open to that. But so far, China hasn't really you know, told us what it is that it doesn't like. It doesn't like... Um, it doesn't like U.S. hegemony, and it doesn't like um, interference in other countries' internal affairs. Those are kind of some of the mantras from traditional Chinese principles of coexist mutual coexistence. And you know, but how do those get operationalized into the international system? And what parts of the international system does China see that violate that? And how would they change it? Th those conversations haven't happened, but I think that they should. Thank you very much. Yes, please. I understood you to say that the uh, Babylon initiative was uh, not a positive one. And would you explain where that stands, uh, what the future of it is, and what the, uh, our U.S. approach should be to that effort? Yeah. That's a great question. So, um, you know, when I was in China, the Belt and Road was called the Great Western Development Program. Jiang Zemin had a program called the Going Out Program, Going Global Program. I mean, this, these things in China, it's kind of like they're made in China 2025. Before that, they had the Indigenous Innovation Program. Before that, they had the Modern Manufacturing Program. I mean, these things all continue under different leaders. It's kind of like in the U.S., actually, you know. We had the pivot to, to Asia, then we had the rebalance, now we have the Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, and, you know, tell me how they're all different. I'm not sure. But... So this strategy, Chinese have had it, I think they've had it actually for quite a long time. It's this idea of economic development was good for Eastern China. We need to, you know, pull these Western parts of China into the rest of China. So we need to give them economic development too, and then they'll be happy and they'll be content to be part of China. We won't have these arrested areas. And while we're at it, you know, we have this overcapacity in cement and steel. And, you know, those Central Asian countries over the mountains, they need development too. We can send our exports over there. So let's, you know, build out some connections to those countries. Oh, and then Southeast Asia, they need high-speed railroads, and we want to increase our influence there and make friends with the government there so we'll, you know, send them some cheap credits, etc. And then all of a sudden it becomes the Belt and Road Initiative, which all started as, you know, disparate hundred different projects in different countries and gets branded this way. Um, and I think, you know, the Chinese haven't been doing 
development assistance for very long. Most of these are supposed to be commercial projects that are on commercial financial terms. They're not necessarily all, they haven't had a lot of feasibility studies done, so we don't know whether they're going to be profitable, sustainable, um, bankable, so to speak. Uh, and so I think the Chinese are running into some problems with this strategy. Um, they're having trouble explaining it to the outside world because people believe they, they, it may be a sort of sweeping grand military strategy. They're looking for bases overseas. I personally don't believe that. They didn't want that Sri Lankan port. They ended up with it because it was a white elephant project and, and you know, they couldn't pay for it. Uh, but, you know, they... And they're going to make mistakes. They're going to make they're going to make good investments too. Um, I think running around the world and saying that everything that China is doing is negative is not a good look for the United States, and it's not what we should be doing. Um, I think we should be looking at what China is doing. We have U.S. companies that are participating in a lot of these Belt and Road projects, but they don't talk about it. But they're you know contractors to a lot of these Chinese projects. GE, some a lot of goods in Africa and elsewhere um, where Chinese are building things. I mean, these can be positive opportunities. Um, but the Chinese are not going to do this and not get into trouble. Because we, we've all done this before. We learned all these lessons. That's why we set up the World Bank and the ADB and the EBRD to, to, to sort of do the feasibility studies, check on the environmental impact, make sure local people were on board with what we were doing. You know, they're going to run into all these same problems and they, and they're, you know, it could be a success. I don't wish it ill because a lot of these countries could use the investment and they appreciate it, but it's not translating into the kind of colossal, you know, strategic um, influence building um, gambit that a lot of people are picking it out to be, I don't think. Thank you. Some analysts have argued that the Chinese have looked at the American uh, supported induced uh, Marshall Plan of the 1940s and 1950s and are now trying to imitate it and also get uh, global influence by an economic aid program, if you like. Do you think that is uh, really not correct? Yeah, it's interesting. The Chinese will tell you as soon as this comes up that this is not a Marshall Plan. But I mean, the Marshall Plan was really about rebuilding the economic infrastructure of the globe, which was in the interest of the U.S. economy at the time, because ours was the last man standing, and we needed people to sell things to. So, um, you know, I think it's a little bit of a different context and a different motivation and a different set. They didn't do that to build influence in the world. They did it out of a practical kind of necessity. Um, and so I, I think China has a problem building soft power. Um, and I think you know, this is one way that they um, have sought to project soft power or acquire soft power and you can't really do it in a, in a concerted way like this. I mean, you do investments because it makes sense for your return on investment. You're not doing it to uh, because you have some other reason, you know, other hidden agenda in mind. And I think countries pick up on that. Chinese needed Chinese Walt Disney or something like that. Sure. <laughs> anyway, we have, we have, we have time for maybe a couple of questions and then we'll finish. Uh, any? Yes, there's a question over there. The lady with the glasses, yeah. Yeah. The microphone is coming, yeah. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Could you speak up, please? Oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, I think uh, most of the Chinese people we are very friendly to American people. Uh, that's very different from the, from the government level. Um, so, uh, uh, so that is one thing. The second thing, I would say two things I would like to uh, United States to improve in terms of the uh, relationship between the United States and China. Uh, one, how do you speak this? Why is that uh, about Taiwan? Uh, I think that Taiwan is a part of China, and that's, uh, I think, you know, the United States agree as well. You have a question about Taiwan, is that well, right? Well, I'll be good. No. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I, would like, I would like United States to, you know, keep Taiwan out of United States policy. Keep it as part of, you know, Chinese policy, because it is a part of China. 
And uh, that's, that's one thing. The second thing is uh, uh, in terms of the international relationship. But now I am the sorry. I would have said the second thing. Another one. The system in terms of the system. Um, oh. Okay. <coughs> Let's focus on the first question, maybe we can do that. I think the question was about what actually is the American policy towards Taiwan. Yeah, yeah so this is, um, I appreciate your, your point of view, but the Taiwan question goes back to the very beginning of the U.S.-China normalization. And we, at that time, had an extensive negotiation actually lasted from the Nixon administration all the way through to the Carter administration and President Carter made this um, kind of very brave decision I think to pursue normalization signed the second communique and uh, went ahead but you know in the United States I think people um, um, have also a special tie a special affinity a special history with people on Taiwan and that's reflected in the one China policy of the United States. Um, it's reflected in the negotiations that we had over a long period of time with China and in all of the interactions we've had with China pretty much since. So the U.S. has a one China policy um, which, you know, it subscribes to um, the joint communiques that were negotiated. And I think, you know, we have a lot of conversations with China about this issue, but we support um, peaceful resolution of the Taiwan question in accordance with the wishes of both sides. So that's the parameters that we insist on. And um, I can get into a lot more detail, but that's the short of it. Thank you very much. A very diplomatic statement. <laughs> we have time for one final question. The final question for this semester, may I add. Maybe this gentleman over there. <laughs> but keep it short. <laughs> I'll try, but uh, we'll see about that. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your discussion on multilateralism about the need for a united front uh, to get China to cooperate on certain issues. Recently, the Italian Prime Minister signed an um, MOU with China, and uh, Brexit's looming, uh, so there could be bilateral deals made with whoever, uh, as the British want to think. Um, what kind of form uh, do you see this united front uh, taking, and uh, what role do you think the U.S. should have in maintaining this front? That's an easy question. The united front should be uh, countries that subscribe to international institutions, norms, and rules uh, that everybody has agreed to, including China. And the United Front should be uh, effort to get China to live up to the commitments that it signed up to. And I don't think that there's any problem with that. That's what we always have done and should do and can continue to do. But do you think there is an attempt by China to divide the Europeans, to divide America's allies, and divide the rule under this motto? Sure. I think we've seen evidence of that. Um, you know, and, and lots of countries practice that kind of approach to international relations to try to split apart of uh, countries that would uh, join forces and try to enforce the rules. But I don't think that um, it's, um, you know, with, with a lot of diplomatic efforts, I don't think that it should be successful. I think that, you know, we should be able to stick together and stick up for our principles and, and for the rules in the international system that, that we've all agreed to. Thank you very much. I think we've worked you very hard. <laughs>